Good morning, everyone. Good morning to you on live stream as well. Uh, first, want to say uh, congratulations on the beginning of your 60th anniversary year for Share. That's a phenomenal uh, accomplishment. Um, I can't say I haven't celebrated my 60th anniversary yet, but um, I've been around the mainframe for a long time. Uh, in fact, I cut my teeth. Uh, I would say in college, uh, I took my first uh, 370 assembler course in. 1977, I think Harry Williams was in that class with me. Uh, not to give away Harry's age or anything. Um, and I've had a great journey in IBM for 35 years. Uh, I did start in Jez2 development. And again, I, I met my career goal my first day in IBM, because I wanted to be an assembly language operating system programmer. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, the journey has taken me long and far. Um, but to come back now, um, as of July in 2014, and be the general manager of IBM's mainframe business is really, really something special for me. Uh, and uh, it's funny, my office today is now about 200 feet from where my first office was in IBM. So uh, IBM Poughkeepsie is my home, and uh, the mainframe is my home. It feels good to be back, and it's great to be able to talk to all of you today about something I love. I'm not going to talk about the past. I'm going to talk about the future. Several thousand IBMers pour their heart and soul into every single machine that we ship out the door. You're talking about people at the technology level, device physicists and material scientists. You're talking about people at the manufacturing level who do all the tooling. You're talking about logic designers who work on the core, people who work on the array cells for the caches. You're talking about people who come up with the DRAM cells and our memory, the board designers. You're talking about application developers, operating system, uh, software developers. You're talking about people who write the firmware, the milli code, the i390 code, the FICON channel code, the IOP code, the coupling code. You're talking about people who work in the core, the NAS, the I.O. side of things, people who do the the cryptographic coprocessors, people who do the power supplies, people who work on the support element on the machine, people who do the mechanical engineering behind the actual frame itself, people who do all of the power and wiring, people who do all the clocking, people who do the pervasive logic. The number of people involved in shipping this out the door is extraordinary. It takes years of effort and hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars of research money to produce. But in the end, every machine that we ship, by definition, is the most reliable, the most secure, and the most performant commercial system available on the market. So that was a video from the Z13 launch on January 14th. Um, and uh, a week from today, the, the system's GA. They're running great um, in some of our early ship program customers, and hopefully you all will grab one sometime along the way soon. So what I want to do, though, is uh, just frame things about what, what we built into Z13 in the software stack and why we did. Um, here's a picture from 2004. Anybody recognize where this is from? Let me show it, let me show the same picture a decade later. Notice the difference? It's, a, it's the papal inauguration. But the real difference um, in this picture is that mobile technology is pervasive today. We all carry around a smartphone, probably a tablet, along with our laptop. Mobile is changing the way we live, the way we work. Um, it really is a productivity tool at work. It really is, helps us connect more with our family, with our friends. Um, it's changing the way we live, and it's changing the way IT systems need to be built. So one of the interesting things for me is that um, back in 2014, the average, for the people that own mobile phones, the average transaction done by everyone with a mobile phone was one per day. And in 2014, the average per day was 37. Now, I don't know where you are on that side of the average. I know I'm probably under 37, and my daughter is over 37. But um, I don't know where you are in that spectrum. But we're really using our phones a lot to live and to work. 
And uh, the interesting and, and somewhat scary thing is that's going to continue to grow. The, uh, our studies show that in the next two years, the average will be 50 a day. And it's headed towards, in the next four years, 100 a day, 100 transactions a day that you do from your mobile phone. Now, what's, 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 what are the characteristics of, 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 of a digital business that the mobile phone embodies? The characteristics are that it's there when you want it. It's secure. I'll go through some of those things. But the, one of the, another interesting thing for me is the mobile phone is becoming the face of companies. Your brand image and the face of your company used to clearly be your people. Um, today, a mobile phone app for many, many companies is becoming the face to their clients. And for many companies today, actually in 2015, more than 80% of those mobile app transactions do not involve a human at all. So when you think about designing your app for your company, whether it's as an enterprise app to be used inside for employee productivity, or probably more importantly for, for the businesses and the clients and the consumers you serve, it's got to be interesting. It's got to be an easy to use, intuitive user interface. But there's some things behind it that your IT systems infrastructure must adhere to. And the, here, these six imperatives that I have on this chart come from uh, IBM's doing more than 6,000 successful mobile solutions with clients around the world. We've studied them. We've looked at best practices. We've looked at patterns. And out of that data comes these six imperatives. And again, I think they're pretty obvious for uh, a crowd like a share audience. But let's just run through them. 24 by 7 by 365. You know, you want to transfer money. You want to do a transaction. You want to do it when you want to do it, not when the store is open or the branch is open or on someone else's timetable because I'm on the East Coast, they're on the West Coast, and, and our business times don't, uh, for normal office hours, don't coincide. 24 by 7, 365 is a must. Users expect subsequent response time. In fact, our studies show that if you go over three, second, three seconds, 40% of the people will we'll terminate the transaction. And I know if it goes over five seconds, especially for me, I usually delete the app. And it takes a while to get an app back on my phone. It's going to take something extraordinary to get an app back on my phone once I go and delete it. So I think we have to think about responsiveness. And personalization is a key. I mean, I'm not sure about you. I'm, I'm willing to give up a little bit of personal information to opt into that to get tailorized, context-sensitive, relevant material offer things brought to me on my mobile device. Um, the shame is that what we're finding is that marketeers around the world in general still haven't adopted and adapted to that. They're not using the power of analytics along with mobile technology to really personalize things for their consumers and their clients. Trust. Um, a lot of people don't trust their personal information, their financial information is going to be held safe by you, by me. And so I think that's something we all have to overcome. I think the technology is there. I think it's down to best practices and being vigilant in securing your systems and your infrastructures. Integration. Consume, we want to have an integrated experience. We don't want to have to go through multiple apps to do something. So integration is a key. Again, that's kind of obvious. And scale is the key, the explosion of mobile users, of mobile transactions, and this thing we call the starburst effect is really putting a stress on systems today. And so having the scale in your infrastructure to be able to support it is absolutely an imperative. Now, there's a lot of businesses, and I assume yours is as well, that's, that is transforming in this digital era. Um, we've got healthcare being transformed. We've got travel and transportation being reformed. We've got financial services. Being, being transformed. I won't go through all these references. Just let me, let me touch on one. It's Sacabe. It's a, the largest credit union in Brazil. They have about 2.5 million customers today. And they're an interesting story that I think might be relevant to this audience. Before seven years ago, they did not have a mainframe. They had a just completely distributed infrastructure, mostly built on x86 and, and Windows. And um, their real struggle was not only to contain costs, but it was to keep their systems available and to build new applications quickly. 
And they made an interesting strategic direction. Their direction was to port all of their systems of record and their systems of engagement to Linux and to move them onto a mainframe running ZVM, running Linux. So they, they were a new client seven years ago, bought a couple of mainframes, one for, one for production, one for backup and recovery and test, ported everything, brought it on there. The next thing was that they wanted to expand their client base. So they, they, they went mobile because they wanted to attract a new generation. So they did all of their systems engagement, again, off of Linux on the mainframe. So systems of record and systems of engagement on the mainframe running Linux. And when I, when I was down in Brazil last month, I talked to the CIO, and he told me, with a big smile on his face, that not only have they been successful, they save millions of dollars every year, their uptime and availability uh, statistics are, are as good as they could possibly be. He said he can sleep at night now, he doesn't get those calls in the middle of the night that he used to get when he was on a distributed infrastructure. But what warmed my heart is he told me that they're now, they've been playing with ZOS for a year, and they're going to put ZOS into production. So that's a really interesting story. Never had a mainframe seven years ago, started with a Linux-only environment, and is now bringing in a ZOS environment for their transactions, their key transactions, key transaction system. And I asked him, I said, well, what about skills? You've got, you've got, you've got a skill base that came from a Windows and a Linux heritage. You've never had a had a mainframe in, the, in this company ever. And he said, that's not a problem. He said, my programmers are very excited to learn ZOS. They have been learning ZOS both on their own and on the job. He said, because he, he, they feel it gives them a new skill set that differentiates them in the market of Brazil. So anyway, an interesting story around it. The most important point around it, though, was that not only did they do the consolidation, get all that savings, but when they went mobile, they did it off the Z platform, something I'll come back to a little bit later. Now, um, since you're here, you must know a bit or a lot about a mainframe. And there's a certain set of fundamental things that you probably come to know the mainframe for in your environment. But I'm going to take a sidestep here. See that statistic up there, 68 for 6? A report from Solitaire Interglobal came out in September of last year, so it's about six months old. Um, they studied 314,326 different organizations and projects. So let's just say that they, they went deep on, on analysis because they wanted to understand and get a global perspective on IT deployment of workloads. They normalized all the workloads they studied with function points so they could get an apples to apples comparison. And as you might expect, the majority of the workloads were either on a mainframe on a Unix system or on x86 running Windows or Linux. Um, the summation of, their, of, what, of what they put together is in a short report that you could get a hold of if you want to. What they did is they took out anything that had to do with projected growth, projected performance, projected capacity. It was all measured on what was running at the time they did the study in the many clients that they, that they talked to. And what was interesting actually telling, and maybe you already knew this, but I'd never seen it quantified like this before. But they went through and they, they, they looked at all expenses, purchase expenses, lease expenses, maintenance, licensing, power, cooling, floor space, et cetera. The only thing they did not include was labor. They couldn't figure out how to get a clean cut on labor because most people work on more than one system. So they did not put labor in here. And what that 68, for six really means, and this is the interesting part for me, is that from a workload expense point of view, 6% of the spend of those organizations goes towards their mainframe, 6%, all in. And the rest is towards x86 and Linux. And I can give you the breakout if you want, but it's huge. But when you looked at the actual running capacity that was used for the function that was deployed, that's where you get that 68. That 68, it's actually 68.94% of the workload was deployed on a mainframe and only 19% on Unix and 11% on Windows. So something we all knew hit, homes, it hit home hard to me with those numbers because we know we count on the mainframe for online transaction processing, for data serving, for trust and secure computing, for, for efficiencies, for virtually limitless scale in a virtualized multi-workload environment. So looking at all of that, what we did when we built the new Z13 is we took all of those 
givens, all those things you count on, all the things we've designed and built into the hardware and the software for the last 50 plus years, and we decided to reinvent the mainframe. So this Z13, the, the technology in this Z13 is more than a billion dollars worth of investment. There was more than 5,000 IBMers uh, involved in creating this platform. We did significant co-creation with clients, as has been done throughout the history of the mainframe. We had significant client involvement in both uh, requirements, design, analysis, proving out, which is really why I'm pretty proud of this set of software and hardware that's coming out. But, and there's more than 500 uh, patented new technologies in this system. From a hardware point of view, um, if you take away the covers, everything is new, top to bottom. If you haven't been able to look inside one of the boxes yet, I think you'll, you'll get a kick out of how we've, you know, we've fit, we flip things on their side and the new cooling and stuff like that. For those of you that are hardware geeks and like to see that stuff, it's a, it's a pretty interesting system design. It's very robust. But aside from that, what we did is we put a major, major focus on what we thought were the three major growth elements in the market and strategies driving your businesses. And that's around mobile, analytics, and cloud. And that's what I'm really gonna touch on a little later in my talk. We know that mobile is transforming everything we do. And we know the mainframe plays an important part on that, a part of that. So we put some significant investment into ensuring that your mobile applications would run like lightning on the mainframe, but also a lot of the other characteristics could be easily taken care of. <coughs> Same thing with analytics. We've done something new and unique with analytics. I'll touch on that in a minute. Something that I hope you really do talk with us about, focus on, see what value you can get out of it in your shops. Again, I think it's something new and unique that's rolling out. We call it in-transaction analytics. Well, I'll get into that a little bit more. And then, of course, from a cloud point of view, you've probably been deploying private clouds, virtualized clouds for a long time within your enterprises. But now with hybrid clouds and public clouds, we want to make sure that the mainframe really participated fully in all three of those environments. So let's touch a little bit about the box itself. 110,000 MIPS in a single frame, or a single set of frames. So it's pretty powerful, 141 cores for your use. Um, so more capacity, more single thread performance. Um, but we added SMT too, so for the first time ever, there's symmetric multi-threading in, in a mainframe core in the Z13. Now we only turned SMT2 on for Java and Linux workloads. We didn't turn it on for ZOS yet. So, but you can get an immediate performance and cap capacity boost on Linux, and the Java throughput and performance is significantly improved with, uh, with SMT2. Now, one of the things we did do is we increased the size of main memory to 10 terabytes. And um, I remember back to my first programming class and was banged into my head when I joined IBM that you had to conserve main memory. Main memory was gold, it was beyond gold, it was platinum, it was really expensive. We worried about every bit and every byte. And that culture and that heritage continues today. Except for today, I'm trying, gonna try to tell you to stop worrying about that. So we've put a lot of main memory in here, and not to get off on promotions, but when you buy a new Z13, we're gonna, we've got a promotion that's out there so that you can triple the amount of memory that you have on your EC12 and it'll cost you the same or less than what you paid for on your EC12. We're really gonna to try to give you uh, a reason to fill the box up with memory. Why? Because memory can change your performance characteristics in highly virtualized environments, in doing in-memory databases, doing advanced analytics. Let's free ourselves up from one of those old paradigms. It's time. So there's a lot of main memory in here. We're gonna price it so that it's very attractive to you hopefully to your companies, to fit your business cases so that you'll fill these boxes up with memory. Um, it's a lot of channels for I.O. This box has been called an I.O. monster. So 320 channels, each channel has two power microprocessors, so 600, 640 dedicated microprocessors just to do I.O. Got double the bandwidth in the cache, double the bandwidth in the I.O., and of course, a lot of synergy with our high-end storage uh, capability, uh, both with flash and just in general for, for serving data. Now, one of the next things we did is there's a significant set of software announcements. Again, 
hopefully you've seen some of them. Um, key to the software and the hardware working together is, is of course, in the balanced system design in, in the System Z, but also making sure that all the way up the stack, the software is there to, to be designed with and exploit the hardware architecture. So things like the DB2 Analytics Accelerator continues to get more functionality and capability built into it, especially when it comes now to doing advanced analytics, modeling, and scoring. Um, now we've announced the capability to put DB2 Blue on the system, so you can have an in-memory database if that's what you choose to do running on Linux. I think there was a lot of demand for this, so we're looking forward to this year as we start to get into deployment with some leading edge customers. We've got Hadoop through Big Insights. Uh, on the platform now, you can get Hadoop in several, from several different vendors, including IBM, for, again, in support of your advanced analytics on the platform. But one of the things we did in the hardware, again, for the first time in a CMOS mainframe, is we put in a vector instruction set. So we've got a full SIMD instruction set that's put in there for mathematically, uh, computationally complex uh, computation, right? Analytics. So our math libraries and some of our advanced analytics project, products from IBM will directly exploit the SIMD capability to get truly accelerated um, analytics. So again, we're trying to design in from the hardware, operating system, middleware layers, and key products that sit on top of that, this synergy throughout the architecture around advanced analytics. And why are we doing that? We think it's a game changer, and I'll give you an example in a second of the type of game changer, or a couple examples actually, of the type of game changing, uh, what the game changing nature that this technology can bring to your business. And another thing we did, of course, and it's up there um, on the lower right, is we've significantly improved the data compression technology, both the speed and the amount that's compressed. And we've taken that load of doing the compression off the main CPU. So there's, very, there's a, almost an indeterminate amount of CPU used now, nowadays to do that compression. So let me just stop for a second and just reflect on an example of what this technology could do for you. So we worked with a large healthcare provider and we've looked at their workloads and they, they do more than a million, they get more than a million healthcare claims a day that come through their systems. And they're, they're a very advanced shop. But what they've looked at is doing fraud detection at the time of the transaction, the time the claim is submitted. And today, they only get a very low percentage of, of the million transactions that they can do full fraud detection analysis on and actually catch the fraud at the time it's entered. So what do they do? They have to pay the claim, and then later on that week, they figure out it was fraudulent, and so they then go chase the person to get the money back. It's called pay and chase. Well, what we've modeled with them, they haven't implemented yet, it yet, but hopefully we will, hopefully they will sometime this year, but we've modeled with them is by doing something, leveraging these technologies called in-transaction analytics, we think, and I believe they think, that we can now do fraud, full fraud detection on every single transaction that goes through the system. And my understanding from their words is that they will be able to catch 80% of fraudulent claims at the time of the transaction. And this is going to save them hundreds of millions of dollars a year. I think that's a business case that will close like that. Again, we've done it. We've done it through benchmarking uh, in Poughkeepsie and through some modeling, um, and they have yet to implement this. But I think that there's significant business value that can be brought to your businesses by doing this thing called in-transaction analytics, something we never did before. Why didn't we do it before? You never did your huge query workloads, huge table scans, and things like that on your mainframe next to your transaction processing system because you were worried that you would disrupt response time and throughput. And response time and throughput was, was key. It was priority number one. So what do we do? We offloaded the data into data warehouses and do the analytics later, right? Forget about the cost and complexity, exp security exposures, the hundreds of cores uh, that you use to offload that data and the, and, the C, and the Z CPU MIPS you use to offload the data, forget about all of that. Just the fact that today, with this new technology that we've announced, you can do things in real time together. And again, I think that's gonna change the nature of the way businesses think about using their data and getting the most out of their operational data that is created on the mainframe. 
So when it comes to uh, cloud, um, we have put a number of uh, new enhancements um, out there. And again, you've probably read about some of these. Be able to support up to 8,000 virtual servers now, 85 plus LPARs. Um, and we've added a third virtualization environment uh, to the platform in KVM. Um, we've done that because we got significant customer requirements from new clients coming to the mainframe, coming there for, for Linux reasons, to run their Linux workloads, and they were used to the KVM environment, uh, and they wanted it extended, and they'd like to move to that paradigm on the mainframe. So we will, we've announced a statement of direction, and we're working on our own distribution of KBM that will be tightly integrated and tuned to the Z architecture. So yes, it will fly. Uh, that virtualized environment will be very good when we do put it out there and make it generally available. And again, it's a third option for you. We're gonna continue to invest in all three virtualization platforms, right? LPARs and PRISM, ZVM, and now also KVM. So you can do virtualization your way. Um, one of the, one of the Two key um, excellent technologies that, that uh, again, I think you all know about and maybe, maybe many of you use in the Z are up in that uh, top right corner, Z-Aware and GDPS. Z-Aware is the IT analytics that can help you sift through the millions of SMF and other log records you're getting and pull out the critical the things that are critical or could be critical and, and highlight them to you. Well, we've, we've now moved that ZOware environment, which only supported ZOS, now fully supports Linux as well. So your IT analytics can support both environments and really give you a good picture of what's going on, especially with your mixed workloads. And the same thing for geographically dispersed parallel sysplex. We've now, that environment is now fully embracing Linux. It could be Linux only. It could be mixed Linux and ZOS. And of course, we'll st continue to support the ZOS environment. So Linux continues to be an important growth element for us and an important technology element. And so that's why we came out uh, with these, these two announcements. Now, I've talked a bit about Linux. Can I get a show of hands? How many folks in here run Linux on Z today? About a third. Well, thank you. Um, did you know that at the end of 2014, out of all the MIPS that are out there in customer shops around the world, 28% of those MIPS run Linux, 28%. So Linux isn't a toy, it isn't something that's just there for fun or, for, or to hack on or whatever. It's a significant portion of our business. Uh, you've, you've voted that way by voting uh, with your dollars and we're gonna continue to enhance that environment for you and thus announcements like this. From a security point of view, we doubled the performance of our Crypto Express card. The 5S is now twice the speed so to make sure we can keep up from a mobile point of view and a transaction point of view uh, in encrypting uh, end to end. And then there's something we call the hybrid cloud connect test drive. I'll talk about that a little later, but it's a way to ensure that we give you a chance to kick the tires when it comes to doing a hybrid cloud. Now, you probably, if you've ever been to Poughkeepsie and talked to the team there, you know that we do very, very extensive testing uh, on our Z systems, on the hardware and the software. In fact, there's about 50 million MIPS on the Z test floor in Poughkeepsie that's running 24 hours a day, that's running both regression workloads, running new workloads. It's there beating the heck out of the software uh, to ensure we get the highest levels of quality. And from a hardware point of view, we stress the hardware big time. We, we take it down to cold temperatures that it should never be in. We raise it up to heat and humid temp, uh, conditions that it shouldn't be in. But we really stress it to find where the corners are. But for Z13, we decided to go one step further and do something that we'd never done before. And so I'm gonna show you a quick video clip, but this is an actual running system. Now when you buy that in this system, went through this test and then it was shipped back to Poughkeepsie and I promise you if you buy a new Z13 it won't be this one. But this system was running throughout this entire test. Can we roll the video please? Here in this laboratory we can run any type of earthquake motion that has existed or has been measured. If a IBM mainframe can pass these motions, then it can be qualified for all the types of earthquakes that we may see and all the types of buildings that the mainframes may be in. 
We go above and beyond testing with IBM because they want to take their equipment above and beyond what the code requires. We have to make certain that no matter whether you've deployed your Z in the middle of the Mojave Desert or you've decided to do so somewhere in Alaska, these systems are able to survive in almost any environment so that their customers, no matter what happens within the data center itself, that their customers never see a blip. That's what high availability is about. We have 24 by 7 support for our clients, whether it's an operating system or the hardware. We have many, many different types of error checking built across the system to prevent the system from ever having a problem. We can correct problems that other systems only dream of correcting on. So I don't know what you think. Um, it's called the shake test. Kind of, kind of pretty severe, but the system ran solid, error-free throughout that entire 8.0 Richter scale test. I thought that was pretty cool. And we're gonna continue to beat the heck out of these systems. I don't know if we're gonna do anything more physically than that, but certainly electronically and driving workloads through them, we're gonna continue to stress them and push them so that we get the highest quality system imaginable for you. So let's go back a little bit and talk a little bit more about mobile analytics and cloud. So from a, from a Z13 point of view, we put out a number of facts and figures when we did the announcement, and here's some of them on the board here. Um, that 2.5 billion transactions per day are not just simple messages. These are complex transactions with two-phase commit, multiple database accesses, and, um, and, the syst and, and the number, that number represents doing 100 Cyber Mondays worth of transactions, at least Cyber Monday as recorded in 2014, transactions on one system in one day. So I think from a, from a performance and scale point of view, this technology is going to perform for you across the board when it comes to your mobile applications. Now, when it comes to mobile applications, one of the things we've studied is what are the most important parts that keep mobile going for you and it's gonna make the best experience for your end users. And as this tree chart shows, about 30% of the effort to building a great mobile app comes in the actual design of the UI and the app itself, which is very, very important, don't get me wrong. And IBM has forged a partnership with Apple. Um, we, we, we are taking help from them in terms of design. Um, you've probably seen we put out about 10, we put 10 applications out jointly together late last year. We've announced four more sis, since then, and we'll have 100 more out before the end of the year. So we're, we care about that UI. I mean, that is the most important thing. I said before, that's a part of your brand out there now, is that user interface, is that mobile app. But that 70% that's below the ground is the thing that can really make the, the user experience phenomenal or terrible. And you can see on the chart, I mean, we want you to be able to increase your speed to deployment, right? Time to value. So there's things that we did in the software to ensure you can use DevOps, agile development techniques, move quickly. You want to do code drops every 10 minutes. Um, we made it, we've, we're ensuring that we've connected with the right rational tools and other tooling environments to ensure that you can do that and connect your systems of engagement and systems of record. We want to make sure that, though, that you can apply analytics, because I think analytics and mobile go together like peanut butter and jelly. They are made for one another, and mobile without analytics, I'm sure, is going to be an unfulfilling experience in the coming uh, months and years. I think you have to have analytics, again, real time is better, built in with your mobile experience. And of course, protecting your data, and you can see all the other things there. Another interesting thing, though, is a recent survey we did is shows that 68% of mobile app developers are completely unaware of what's going on in the back-end systems. And we see that in some of our clients. We worked with a large European bank that, was, that, that told us a, a story about a mobile banking app that they put at put out and one of their users hit the transaction limit on the mobile app and they, they needed to call her up and find out why. And this was a nice elderly grandmother who had their mobile app and was checking to see if a 20 pound check had cleared, but she checked so many times 
that she actually hit the transaction limit because every time she went to check, the thing we call, talked about called the starburst effect, one touch to her mobile phone screen kicked off 27 transactions to the back end systems. Now, there's a couple things going on here with mobile, right? She, did, she actually did, I think, 70, she, she, hit, she checked 70 times in like a three or four hour window and then hit a clip level so they cut her off. But so, you know, mo we say mobile's changing everything. You, you'd never walk into a branch and check to see if a check cleared 70 times in one day. You might do it once, right? You wouldn't even call in. But on a phone, it's in your pocket, you're gonna go check. And also, you can't predict what end users are gonna do. That starburst effect. One hit, 27 transactions to the back end. There's another uh, large bank in Australia that their app developers came up with something cool. When you shake your phone, it would show your account balance. And one Friday night, <laughs> I kid you not, one Friday night at about 7 p.m., the systems went haywire. The transaction spikes were through the roof. All the bells and whistles went off. System programmers and admins in the room, you would have gotten a call. They all got calls. What's going on? They figured out by the next morning that the marketing department had run a television ad showing everyone about the shake. And so everyone was taking their phone out, watching TV and shaking their phone all at the same time. Unpredictable, right? Unpredictable. Starburst effect and mobile make it unpredictable. So you got to build a back end that scales and scales with integrity and also, again, maybe a little education with the app developers about how they should be designing and building their apps might be good. Um, now we've talked, you've heard me say systems of record, systems of engagement. I haven't said the word systems of insight yet. Let me just try to clear those terms with you in case you haven't. So systems of record, think of your, your online transaction processing. That's what I mean when I say that, right? Systems of, of engagement, those are the new applications built in the modern paradigm, built in Java or some other modern language, maybe running in a public cloud, maybe running in a private cloud, but they're there, they're built again with modern technologies and techniques and they're meant to really support your mobile devices, your tablets and your phone. And systems of insight are those systems that bring together a lot of different data sources and, and generate um, insights through advanced analytics. Now the, the interesting thing on the, on the mainframe, especially on the Z13, is you can choose in your establishment how you want to set things up, but we've provided not only the software with the right control, the right deployment, the right performance that you can run your systems of record, systems of engagement, and systems of insight all on the same platform. That's something I don't, not many other people, uh, other technologies can do because they really don't have that high-end system of record. But again, we've set it up so that it's your choice on how you want to take advantage of it. The reason I think you might want to consider running your systems of insight on the Z is simply, is simple. You put the analytics close to where the data originates, the performance is going to be better, the cost is going to be less, and you're going to get real-time insights. So, from a mobile point of view, we've got some technologies that help uh, put, uh, pull our systems of engagement and our systems of record together. And um, our branding is the mobile first. Hopefully you've, you've heard about that. From a mobile first point of view, you can, you can build your mobile apps in the cloud, you can deploy them in the cloud, or you can deploy them back onto the Z. We've got a whole set of connectors there that allow you to connect to your systems of record easily and quickly and efficiently, and efficiently. And this direction of ensuring that the, the backend systems can easily connect to a mobile, we will continue, we'll continue to enhance this environment. It's a very robust environment today. And there's a lot of success going on around the world with clients deploying mobile first apps, again, either with both the SOE and the SOR on the Z, or the SOR on the Z and the SOE in a privately hosted on-prem or out in a public cloud. Um, there's some more examples of how customers are deploying mobile. Uh, I mean, US mobile for, the, for highly classified communications is running their, their systems off of a Z. Um, there's a lot of mobile payments. Renfee is doing this from a ticketing point of view. Renfee is a, is a, is a large organization in Spain that does ticketing for trains. And what they did with mobile and analytics 
to fight the competition. And who's the competition for trains these days? Low-cost airways, right? Low-cost airways are the competition for trains. They combined on their Z doing their systems of record, their ticketing system, along with advanced analytics and mobile so that their customers could get real-time offers and promotions. And in one year, they increased ticket sales by 11%. So the last example I gave you of an insurer was how to save cost. This is an example of how to grow revenue, satisfy clients, bring the experience to them in context, increase your sales, increase, increase your revenue. Renfee is doing that today. Um, so one of the things that we ran last year and we're running it again, a new this year, is the, the mobile app contest, the throwdown. I don't know, anybody here participate in the mobile app throwdown? Ah, at least one, two, maybe from the same company. Where do you work? Okay. So um, we had, I think there was about 35 companies that, that participated last year, and we pulled a winner at, at Enterprise there, and um, we announced the winner at Enterprise in November. We're doing it again. We want to encourage you. It's a way to have some fun. It's, it's uh, your app. It's your data. You do it in your shop. Uh, we'll give you some expertise if you need some help along the way. Um, there's a couple conditions that it has to be built on mobile first and a few simple things like that. Um, but we will again run this contest. Uh, it's a way for you to, uh, to maybe get your mobile app development along with the mainframe moving, get some help from us, and in the end win some cool prizes. Um, one, of the, yeah, one of the key things is that you got to connect back into one of your systems of record. Um, so with mobile, and I've talked about mobile and analytics, and I'll just try to use this uh, to illustrate it, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the analytics capability on the new Z13. But if you look at the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s and now in 2015, think about basically the same, the same scenario, the same engagement over those different decades, right? I mean, back in the, in the postal days when we all could only rely on the post office and getting mailers and newsletters and things mailed to us, you know? I mean, the response time was in, was, was in days or longer. In the, tw in the 20s, in the 2000s, I mean, I mean, with online purchasing and things like that, product association, response time started to change in doing historical analysis via the web. But with mobile now, with mobile now, we can do real time, in context, user personalized, situational, situationally aware analysis to change what you do, to change how you support your consumers. So what we want to do, so here's another one of those moments I want you to stop and think, because there's something you've been doing for probably 20 or 30 years, and I want you to stop and think about changing the behavior of the past. The behavior of the past has been, and, and because technology demanded it, is that you, you created your operational data on a mainframe, and you ETL'd it off, and you built business warehouses, you did your BI and, your, and your, 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 your querying and things like that on other platforms. It's redundant, but it was the way it had to happen. It's costly and complex, but it's the way it had to happen. All right? With the technology we've announced in Z13, hardware and software working together, we can change that forever. And I'm going to talk to you a bit, little bit about it. But again, it's one, another one of those points. So it's a reconsideration point. Um, we've done a lot of studies and looked at this. Let's just take this from a cost point of view. We've done a lot of studies and looked at the cost of offloading data. The cost alone of offloading at just a terabyte, just a terabyte today, and the number of copies that you then make, because you never make one copy of it, Using, looking at both the cost of the mainframe uh, MIPS as well as the distributed cores um, for a terabyte a day could easily cost you three to four million dollars over a couple years. Easily cost you that much. And who wouldn't like to save that? That doesn't count then the security exposures and other things that go on. But uh, my, my plea to you is not a cost a business case. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to convince you that, you wanna, that you're going to work with your lines of business and you're going to make a line of business business case that's a game changer because of keeping the data with the transactions and doing the analytics real time. So the first thing here is what I want to encourage you to consider 
is keeping the full data life cycle on the mainframe. So it starts in that upper right hand corner when you're doing your transactions, that's where the data is created, right? And you still have to do data transforms, that's the blue circle to lower right. You still have to do data transforms, but you do it within the mainframe, right? So you get the data in the right, in the right um, shape and, and, and in the right format to do your analytics. You integrate data from other sources. You can bring other sources if you want to into the mainframe to do this. You can do your reporting off the mainframe, lightning fast reporting, won't disrupt your transaction processing because of, again, the technology we've put into the hardware and the software. But most importantly, and that's that top left one, you can do your modeling for advanced analytics, including SPSS and other key modelers, and then you can, do, you can act on those models. You can do real-time scoring, whether it's for fraud detection, upsell, cross-sell, or whatever, whatever, uh, whatever way you use the data and the analytics in your enterprise. That full data life cycle, you should really think about and consider keeping it on the mainframe now because of speed, accuracy, and getting insights and using them at the point of impact, not getting insights a week later and wishing you had them at the point of impact with the client. Um, we have done a number of things that were announced uh, back on January 14th that we've got uh, you know, big insights uh, on the system. We've, we've updated some of, the, some of the software, like CPLEX uh, with SIMD support. We talked about the SIMD support. You know, we, we're updating the, the DB2 Analytics Accelerator. All of these things have been done in the context of the six-point data lifecycle and about lowering your cost but creating true new business value through getting insights early and using them at the right time. Let me give you an exa another example. And here's three clients that have all used um, IDAA and have done it to, for business impact. But petrol is an example I like to use. Petrol is a petroleum and a gas company in Slovenia. And like most gas companies, they have a set of gas stations and a set of retail convenience stores that go along with those gas stations. And what they do is, that with, through their loyalty program, looking at customer buying behavior, um, they've been able to do some real-time analytics and do upsell, cross-sell on their point-of-sale terminal in the convenience store, operated by a normal clerk that's not trained, right? So they, they, when I come in, I pump my gas, I come in, I maybe pick up a bottle of water and a, and a hard roll, I go to check out, I give them my loyalty card, and they see who I am, because I've got my loyalty card, they see what my purchase is, and they imme immediately put a promotion up that's tailored to me based on past purchases that, that is something that I might want to additionally purchase. Ross, we've, you know, the clerk might say to me, I see you, thanks for buying gas, the water, and a hard roll. Wouldn't you like some cookies, too? The cookies are 50% off for you today. Right? So it's that kind of offer. And kidding aside, just by doing that, they've increased their retail sales by 5% in one year. Wouldn't you all like your companies to increase retail sales by 5% in one year? And, this, and in this case, they can track it right back to the analytics in making that cross-sell, that upsell cross-sell. So it's a powerful example, and it's a reason why, again, you want to consider doing more real-time analytics. Um, if we head to cloud, there's a lot being talked about cloud. Cloud is one of the most talked about uh, topics in the, in the industry today, I think. 85% um, of new software is being built for the cloud, right? Cloud deployment has grown 92% since 2012. Again, probably many of you have been doing private clouds, probably on a Z in your shops for many years now. But cloud really is a, a, a deployment model that's changing the game so that it's easier for you and it's easier for consumers to, to, get, to, their, to get to their apps. It's more of potentially more cost effective for you buy by the drink versus doing it all yourself. So from a cloud point of view, we want to make sure that the mainframe Z13 played in all scenarios. So again, we talked about private cloud. Um, we'll go to the other side, to public cloud. There are, there are more than 80 customers today in the world serving their public clouds off the mainframe. I didn't know that. Um, I just got that fact in the last three months. I think that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought that, but I guess with the robustness and the security that's there, a lot of, a lot of clients, 80 of them around the world, are choosing for private, uh, public cloud. 
the cloud that I think is the model that you all are going to adopt now, if not now, then over the next five years, is the hybrid cloud. That's the one where there's a, there's a secure connection between your back-end systems and a public cloud so that you can encrypt the transaction, you can manage it, but you're leveraging both the public cloud, perhaps for your system of engagement or something else, because it makes sense for that application, but you're leveraging your, your back-end systems and you're tying them together. I think hybrid cloud is really where most companies like yours and ours are gonna end up. It's that mixture. So with that, what we've done is we've put together several offerings to help you get there. The enterprise cloud system was announced around the middle of last year. That's really for new buyers, maybe not the folks in this room, it's for new buyers that want to buy a new Z and have the cloud capabilities pre-integrated in our factory before it's delivered to them. So this can lower their costs and again, speed their time to value. What I think might actually be applicable to you though is something we announced last week at Interconnect. It's called the Z Systems Hybrid uh, Cloud Connect Test Drive. It's a long word, but it's a test drive. What it is, it's a way for you and your shop to try out a hybrid cloud. What we'll do is we'll assign a technical resource to you. We'll give you three months for free of a, a virtual server and soft layer, and we'll give you access to Gateway as a Service for those three months for free as well. So we'll give you some expertise and some guidance and we'll give you the ability to leverage SoftLayer Gateway as a service and try it out for yourself. I think it's a proven and reliable method that we've seen for deploying hybrid clouds. And again, if the technology is interesting to you and you'd like to kick the tires, we'd love to, ha to, to have you do that with us. Because again, I think from all the data I see and all the clients I've talked to for the last seven months, hybrid cloud looks like the mode that everyone's gonna move to. So why not test drive it for free on IBM? Give us a shot. Um, just to, as we start to wrap up here, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of technology in Z13, but it's not really useful if you can't really develop and deploy apps quickly. And so we've announced a number of things uh, on January 14th, and just, just four of those areas are up here on this chart. Uh, from a patterns point of view, there was quite a client demand to look at patterns uh, for Linux on Z. And so we announced the 12 most popular patterns that we think covers the majority or the a significant amount, more than 50% of the workloads deployed out there today. So again, patterns are a way to get quick time to value from a Z Linux environment. Um, you also know that we've put a lot of announcement and, and, and energy into Bluemix and Bluemix both on-prem and in the cloud support Z. You can develop your apps in the cloud and you can target the run times to run on Z or you can get the on-prem version of Bluemix like several large customers have done and start to deploy that uh, internally on their own. Um, from a compiler point of view, we've really done some cool things in the compilers to leverage the new architecture and to optimize so you can get immediate performance improvement through a recompilation. So hopefully you'll give that a shot. And then from an open technologies point of view, we continue to bring open technologies onto the platform. OpenStack and our management stack, the announcement to do KVM we talked about before, and now um, we're working with Docker to bring, to bring Docker, Docker container capabilities onto the platform as well. Java runs on Z better than any other platform out there. It's faster, more reliable. We've put significant investment under the covers to make that happen. And if you don't believe us, challenge us on it. We'll take you through it, we'll show it to you, we're happy to demonstrate it. We rerun Java is world class on Z, especially again with some of the new technology that's out there optimized, ready to go, and it's straight old Java. Move your jars over, run them, they're gonna go. Um, now I'm gonna slow down here for one second, and I know that, uh, that there's, a, that there's a 11 o'clock session on the new software pricing announcements, but I love all that technology I just talked about, and I mean, I love it with a capital L, and there's so much more to talk about and to go into details with you. But we have made, we made four pricing announcements. The two on the right, um, the one on the lower right, that one we made last year was mobile MIPS pricing on ZOS. And then the one above it is around uh, TPF, um, important for the TPF client set. But I want to focus on the two on the left. Um, I think that we've taken away with these two software pricing announcements, two of your largest concerns, complaints, 
contention challenges to us when it comes to our software pricing methods. And we've done this to try to give you flexibility and take those issues completely off the table once and for all. So ICAP, IBM Co-Located Application Pricing. Think of that as container pricing. What we did for mobile workload, mobile MIPS pricing, we've generalized this now to any new workload that's gonna come onto Z. Whether it's a Linux workload or a ZOS workload, you can containerize it and you pay for what you use. Let's use an example. You got a thousand MSU LPAR running Kix DB2 and you wanna put a 10 MSU MQ workload in there. What did we do in the past? You move MQ in, we charge you for a thousand MSUs, right? So what'd you do? You probably didn't put it in there. You left it somewhere else. You put it on a distributed platform and you talk to me about why are you doing that to me, Ross? It doesn't fit my disaster recovery scenario as well. It doesn't have the right availability characteristics. You're hurting me on performance, but you're, and you're all doing this because of your pricing methods. Come on, Ross. So we've taken that away. You wanna take that 10 MSU workload and put it in there, we're gonna charge you for the 10 MSUs. That goes across the board. Again, there's another session coming up where you can really ask a lot of questions about this if you want to. Um, We've got new software that we will deploy to do the measurement. It's in beta now, and I expect uh, this capability to be announced generally available within the next month or so. The other uh, pricing is known as country multiplex pricing. Remember all those complex rules that you hate that have to go to how you configure? You have to configure in a sysplex. It has to be half DB2 data sharing. If I move workload from one data center to another, um, I'm gonna get charged for that movement and it's gonna be exorbitant, right? We're taking all those rules away, all of them. Your workloads, you run them where you wanna run them, we're just gonna charge you for the MSUs you use. Again, there's a process to go through, you're gonna install some software, you're gonna run it for 60 days to get a, to get a baseline, and we're just gonna get rid of all those rules and you can, you can run the software where you want to. Ray Jones and a, and a talented team will be up here and we'll be happy to talk more about this, but I really want, I think it's game changing. It's game changing a uh, set of announcements and it's gonna help you put workload where it technically makes sense on our platform. Um, so one of the passions that I have is in education, especially around Z-Skills. Hopefully you're all leveraging our academic initiative. You've seen these stats probably before. We're around the world in 70 countries and growing more than 1,400 universities. Many of you, I sure, I'm certain, participate and leverage this program. Um, 2016, we're gonna have another World Championship Master of the Mainframe Contest. We've announced it countrywide around the world in 2015, so all the countries will do their Master of the Mainframe to get that young talent out there proving that they can, they can write great code on the mainframe and competing, and we'll, in April of 2016, we'll bring those winners from around the world to New York City and run the final championship there. Perhaps uh, some of you as our customers will be invited to be judges because it's gonna be a customer panel that does the judging. Um, there's of course a lot, a, a lot of online courses and the Marist and Linux Foundation um, have put together some MOOCs which uh, again are getting highly leveraged and there's the new Z Job Connector um, website. We had a jobs board in the past where you could, we could just post to it. Now both sides, people looking for employment and people seeking skills to come and be employed can both post on there. Matches can be made, the connection can be made there. So please consider using that when you're looking to hire someone or if you're looking for a job. And uh, let, me, uh, let me start to wrap up here. So there's a lot in this announcement. We could literally talk for three or four days with the amount of technology and capability. I've just summarized it. I've summarized it around mobile, analytics, and cloud. I've talked about the pricing announcement. I've talked about skills. There's a ton of stuff in there. I really appreciate you uh, considering it. I look forward to dialoguing with you. And what I'd like to do now in the last 10 minutes is open it up and see if you have any questions for me. Can you divulge any information about uh, the Z13's smaller brother? The ah, BC. the smaller brother. No, we didn't, we didn't announce anything about Z13 smaller brother. But I think the way you should think about it is usually about a year after we announce the big brother, the little brother comes along. So I just keep thinking, you know, you've seen what we've done in the past. 
and we, we might do something like that again in the future. I wanted to ask about the missing link, if you will. Um, our end user customers are no longer getting the message directly from IBM. The reality of the business used to be that they drove us nuts. When are we getting the new machine? And they pushed and they pushed and they pushed. Now they're not getting the message and they're not pushing and our management is, and that of many other shops, yeah. is taking the opportunity to go to open platform. Yep. So in that case, you have one or two highly placed executives who are deciding direction for the business because they liked somebody's presentation better and the users aren't getting the message to put the pressure on the management to go in the right direction. Very well said. Uh, thank you for not, for not making it a softball. First off, um, I hear you loud and clear. I see that across the, around the world. And so what are we doing about it? So one of the reasons that we've positioned the new mainframe, and we, talk, we don't really talk much about speeds and feeds. If you looked at the press release, it's all about the mobile app economy. We're positioning around mobile analytics and cloud is because IBM's, IBM's marketing, targeted marketing, digital marketing, print marketing, um, airport marketing, and all that will be tied around those themes. And we can draft underneath that, and then we're gonna, and we're gonna leverage that to try to get to CEOs, CFOs, CMOs, line of business executives. Now I would tell you we're early in the year, but by, by messaging and positioning the, 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 the new Z13 differently than we've done all the other ones, we seem to be breaking through at least where I've been. I've been in, uh, I did the launch event in New York and then I went to China for two launch events, Japan for one launch event and Brazil for one launch event. And in the discussions with clients there, some of which were IT shop and some were line of business, they were very intrigued about how we had repositioned the mainframe. And again, if you look at, when we look at all of our social media, we do analytics on social media, we do analytics on all the press that's been written, all the blogs that have been written so far. We're looking at not just influ who influences, but the, who the influencers are, but all the, the influence from that through our social analytics. It looks like our message is starting to resonate outside of, you know, you all who we appreciate. So our absolute strategy is to try to get our message clearly out to the folks that are making the decisions in your shop these days. Especially one of the things I'm seeing is, you know, the, the days of the CIO that started, you know, as a system programmer and kind of worked their way up over 20 or 30 years to become the top, the CIO. Uh, many of the CIOs around the world today, you know, came from Windows and new apps or app development, never were really in hardcore IT and are now the decision makers. So again, you, we've just begun, but we're trying to target that audience and try to influence them. So uh, we'll take feedback along the way once you see some of our, our ads and how we do things digitally, which hasn't really launched yet. Ross, so. respectively, my, respectfully, my customers, the last commercial they remember is who stole the servers. <laughs> That's, That's that one. is a fact. That's a good one. They're the ones with the budgets to commit, yep. and they're not getting the message. Yep. No, I, I, I know that. So a, I'm going to make this a longer answer. So we're reinventing the way we do marketing in IBM, and I don't really want to go into it. The entire IBM marketing system, top to bottom, from our CMO down, is in change right now to target the cohorts that are, those, that are the folks that we need to influence. I promise you we've got this in our gun sites. We just haven't started to execute on it yet. That was why I referred to the digital marketing. We are going after them. We are going to try to influence them. Again, I'll talk to you in, in a year and we'll see if we did, but that, that's, what, that's what my game plan is and that's what IBM's game plan is. So my question sort of builds on Linda's question. It's basically, if you're just talking, preaching to the choir, you may get them familiar with the, all the information about it, but the influencers these days are the people back at home, the people who see the cartoons and show the mainframe as a dead dinosaur. Uh, all the non-IT people who are absolutely sold on the idea that the mainframe is long gone and then make CIOs feel ashamed for having a mainframe. What can IBM do to get the word out about the mainframe to non-IT people? All right. Um 
You really think that non-IT people at home are the influencers, huh? Absolutely. Okay. In-flight magazines, you name it. All the different things where all the, the scuttlebutt happens. Uh, okay, I see what you're saying. So it's not so much my mom sitting at home watching TV. It's, it's in, it's in consumer-oriented uh, um, paper. So again, our digital campaign, which there will be some print, but our digital campaign will be targeting um, non-IT professionals both, but it'll probably first start off by role, CMO, CFO, line of business, CEO, I mean, by industry, and we're gonna be targeting them. And again, it hasn't started yet, but the idea is to digitally get in front of them, whether it's web banners, it, it might be some emails, but it's probably more of you know, social web banners and other digital assets that they will see. Um, and you know, the two movies that you saw that I showed, there were little clips. Uh, we've created um, quite a bit of digital assets that are going out there as well. So we're hoping that uh, through movies, social, and all that, we're going to start to change that perception and get the word out. Uh, that is absolutely our strategy. It hasn't begun to, it hasn't really kicked off in full force yet. But uh, the entire IBM marketing department, from John Awada down, is transforming as we speak. So. Give, us, give, me a, give, give me a couple months, and I'm hopefully next time we'll have a slightly different conversation. Because I agree with you. We all need the air cover. It's, it's, a, it's recognized as a problem. We have a plan of attack. So hopefully we'll, again, in a year, we'll have a different conversation. So when I talk to these new generation CIOs, CEOs that you're talking about, they, they give the mainframe credit for security, availability, but what they have trouble buying into is that they can get the business agility they want. They're all about how do I get from an idea to implementation as fast as possible to give me an advantage over the competitor. Yep. What do you think IBM and the vendor ecosystem need to provide to really win them over? Well, I think um, that the tools to do DevOps, agile development, to absolutely development in the most modern paradigm with the most modern languages, iterate and do it quickly is all there today and can be deployed um, on to, and is, can be deployed on Z. And so maybe we haven't communicated well enough about um, the tooling that's there today to be able to operate in that environment. You want to do code drops every 10 minutes? You can do it. You can do it on a mainframe. I don't suggest you do it with your operating system. But with your applications, that's the way you want to do it. You can do it today. Uh, I think Mike Pereira is here. Mike, are you giving a talk at all this year about DevOps or any of that? No? Yeah, well, the APIs. So listen, um, so I think we can do it. Obviously, the message isn't getting out. If you'd like to talk some more about it, because I'll be here all day. And again, Mike Pereira is here. We're happy to talk one on one. Maybe that's a good topic that we bring back here with some real life examples of how you can do agile, distributed agile development today on a mainframe. Uh, going back to your slide that talked about having up to 8,000 virtual machines running on one box, uh, more than 50 uh, per core. And then on the same slide, you talk about KVM specifically. Uh, we're kind of concerned about the message being muddled and misinterpreted in the marketplace because you don't specifically call out 8,000 ZVM guests as opposed to virtual machines, people are assuming that because KVM is on the same slide, you're talking about 8,000 KVM virtual machines mm. on one box, and that ain't gonna fly. Yeah, uh, I don't think we meant, yeah, okay. So well, we've gotta really differentiate that first one. Yes, you do. Okay, and I got it. The, well, the problem is, by and large, IBM never utters the word ZVM on any slide unless they're from ZVM. I'll fix it. I'll put ZVM on the slide. I'm very proud of ZVM. I'll put yeah. it on the slide. I, I consider yeah. that update done, all right? Thank you. Yes, this is more probably of a softball, but it goes to what some of these other people are asking. You know, I'm a vendor. I travel worldwide. And I'm always asked, uh, how's the mainframe doing? And there's so little information about the health of the mainframe in the marketplace. Mm. How many mainframes are out there? How many, how are they penetrated in the industries? Uh, you know, everybody else has their numbers out there that's saying, hey, I'm growing 18% or so. When you take a look at a mainframe and the way we do mainframe growth through 
you know, engines and stuff. It's just totally different. And, mm -hmm. and there's just doesn't seem to be any good information out there to show folks how well we're doing in the mainframe market. Okay. It would be very useful for that. Okay, I will take that as a to-do. I'll, I'll give you two data points, but I'll take it as a to-do. We could probably build an infographic or something like that that'll easily convey the health of the market. Um, you look at the last decade, and the average of all mainframe clients around the world growing their traditional workloads is 12% MIPS, MIPS growth. 12% MIPS growth for the last decade. But if you look at the top 500 clients, uh, that's well over 20% MIPS growth. If you look at the other side, the Linux side, of just the same time period of the last 10 years, the Linux MIPS growth is 35%. Those are compound growth rates, 35% compound growth rate. So um, we are seeing tremendous growth uh, of workloads, and we're seeing a lot of vendors, ISVs in particular, new ISVs and new applications come. I don't have the fourth quarter numbers, but third quarter, 14, there were, I believe it was, there were 54 new ISVs in the third quarter alone that came onto the platform with about 4,000 4, uh, new applications that came onto the platform. So I take it that we're not communicating well. I got that, and I'll, I'll go talk to the marketing guys, and we'll figure out how we can get something out that better conveys the health of the mainframe and the ecosystem. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned the one customer who had finally put in a mainframe after all these years. How often does that happen? Those are the uh, kinds of things. Yeah, okay. That would so be very we, we, we get 20 to 40 new mainframe customers per quarter. 20 to 40. It varies. It's, it just depends. So there's a lot, quite a few new clients. Uh, the interesting fact is that uh, the, you know, the majority, well, about half are Linux only which is why I told the Sakube story, because they were Linux only. I was very happy with this, and now I'm ecstatic that they're going to put ZOS in, but we've got a few more of those to tell as well. My time is up. Thank you all very, very much.